God lovingly has put his revelation in our hands that we can know him. Today we're going to talk about, in a two-part series, about the Word of God. And as we, I said this morning already, it's like breathing, because we should be breathing in and breathing out as we are communicating with God and praying to God, giving Him the praise, laying beside, before Him our requests, and then taking in, taking in God's Word as well. And just as we need to breathe, to be alive, if we are going to have the appearance of life, as, as believers, if we're going to resemble our calling, then we need to be in a relationship with God that is active and that we are engaged in. You know, God has revealed himself to his creation. And I think, I think you probably noticed that. If you ever go out on a starry night and look up there and see all the stars in the sky, and knowing that it's, the Bible says in the very beginning, in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth and spoke everything that we see into existence with the word of his power and holds it together and keeps the things spinning in orbit, the planets, the constellations, the galaxies, and how enormous creation is. And, and I was just this week looking at, they said, look at the Hubble telescope. And they went shot it at a place where they shot for a long period of time into something that just looked black, black, empty space. And they held it and they went further, saw further out than they'd ever seen before. And it wasn't just stars that were out there, but there were whole other galaxies that they hadn't even seen before. And they discovered these galaxies, enormous ones, which would engulf our own Milky Way. And just saying, we don't even know how this is, sci this is scientifically isn't even possible by our understanding of science. We serve a great and powerful God. And, and the psalmist declares, the heavens declare the glories of the Lord. And Romans 1 says that creation, creation tells us that we have a creator. And God has revealed himself through creation. Of course, Romans also goes on to say that men suppress a knowledge of God. And so God, and because of our sin, that we don't have a right relationship with God and our knowledge of him is very broken. But God also reveals himself intimately, most, most exceptionally through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to save us. Make no mistake, he came on, on a mission. But he also showed us who Jesus was. I mean, I know who God, God was in the person of Jesus Christ in a way we could understand, in a way we could comprehend. We could see what God loved. We could see what God was passionate about. We could see his holy character. And he has also given us his word, which is the Bible. And that's what we're going to take. Now, we long for that day when we will get to see Jesus Christ again face to face. Because you and I haven't had the chance. The disciples had the chance, but God has given us his word. And we are still at work as believers. And you can kind of think of it, maybe you can, for those of you who are in the military, you are on duty right now, and maybe you're overseas. And I don't know how you actually felt, but how occasionally you might get a letter from home. And the joy of getting that correspondence with home. I, I remember it, it was hardly hardly military service, but I remember going off to camp. And I mean, like real camp, you know, where there weren't, wasn't the internet and tablets and electric, electrical things. You had flashlights and sleeping bags and you didn't have correspondence with home like today. And halfway through camp, because we did have a mess hall where everyone would meet, uh, letters would come in and especially the younger kids, you'd be so excited. I got a letter from mom. Because there was that correspondence home, and you know, people in, in second, third, fourth grade, they start to get homesick, and they get that letter, and they're so excited to have that letter from home. And, and in a very similar sense, what God has done for us is even though we are not yet with him face to face, yes, he puts his spirit in us, and that's something that we need to take very seriously because God is with us and present with us. But he also gives us his word that we have, it, its Bible has been called a love letter from God to you. And of course, it's more than that. That's an oversimplification. But God lovingly has put his revelation in our hands that we can know him. 
that we can learn about him, that we can learn how to live, that we can be his people. And so many times, uh, I don't know what person would be excited about a letter from home saying, I'm just so glad my parents took the time to write me this letter and just put it in your bag and not read it. What do we do? We want to rip that thing open and we want to read that letter word for word and sometimes time after time. And instead, we need to make sure as we're looking this morning, if we want to be the people that we are called to be, if we want to try and figure out what the Bible says as a Christian, then we need to take God's word and we need to make it a part of our lives. And so we're going we're gonna to look at the Bible in two parts. So we're going to just start off this morning. I want to just explain a little bit about what, what the Bible is. It's, it's the most published book, most read, most translated publication in the entire world of all times. This is a bestseller year after year. You won't find it on the New York Times list because they, they just kind of grandfathered it out and said, okay, you get the Lifetime Achievement Award. We'll let, we'll let somebody else get the other awards. But the Bible is. Um, it has been banned. It has been burned, and yet it endures. It has centuries have passed and cultures have changed. Kingdoms have risen and fallen. There have been revolutions. There have been inventions. There have been cultural changes. But the word of God endures as God promised it would. And we, we are so privileged to have that. So as we, as we go to open up God's word, let's just pray that God would continue to reveal himself this morning and, and teach us about his word. Lord, we thank you so much that you would love us, that you would reach out to us, that you would rescue a rebellious and sinful people through your Son. And that you wouldn't only save us from our sins, but you would save us for a relationship. And you would share with us who you are in your Word. I pray that as we study it this morning, that you would give us a greater appreciation and hunger for your Word. Please guide my own words and that they would be spoken in a way that is clear and, and reflects you appropriately. And please open all of our hearts to receive that which you have to give us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at the Bible, second here, looking around for my clicking device. Otherwise I have to... All right, I don't think I have it. So let's go to the next slide. Um, when we're introduction to the Bible, what we want to look at here is a little bit of understanding of the Bible. Because if you walked in this morning and you said, okay, um, I want to figure out what Christianity is about. And you guys talk a lot about God and you're really excited about a book. And there was one person that I remember reading one of his biographies who came to Christ. And he said, I never could understand why Christians were so excited about the Bible. I'm like, they're really excited about that book. And sometimes people think, is it like a glorified book club? We don't really get it. Why the Bible? Well, I've already said in, in my kind of opening comments that the Bible is God's revelation to man. And so for us, it is a way to know God, that he has revealed himself generally, like we talked about through all creation, but also specifically for people everywhere through his written word. And that we have that. It's, uh, it's really not one book, although the word Bible means book, but really it's 66 books that we have. Um, there are the Old Testament, and you have the New Testament. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. And if you're ever reading through that, at the very beginning of most Bibles, like my Bible, you get past the title page, and I have this long preface, but there's a table of contents. And so sometimes when I say turn to the book of Corinthians or turn to the book of Galatians or Hebrews or whatever, they have that there and they even have page numbers. So some of the people here, um, they, they don't know the order any better than you. Some of the people have tabs. If you don't know what tabs are, the little markers, so you can turn straight to the book of the Bible. But you can turn, find the page, turn to a passage. And that's, that's how we break up this Bible, is by the separate books. Um, now, each of these se 66 separate books was written over a period of 1,500 years from start to finish. So the oldest portions of the Bible are 1,500 years old. I think that's wrong, isn't it? It's more than, at least... Yeah, but, uh, what? 3,500. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Y you said 1,600. I'm like, you're only adding 100 here. But, uh, <laughs> 
Exactly, and I wrote that down wrong. That's why I said 1,500. But uh, I was going to make a remark about Bob was there to remember it, and that's why I was asking him for questions. But, uh, yeah, and Moses did write the first five books of your Bible. That's called the Pentateuch. We'll get back. But for from like fi- of roughly 1,500 B.C. until roughly 90 A.D., it's a big period of time, over a period of 1,500 years, not 1,500 years old. Uh, It was written by over 40 authors who, for the most part, didn't know each other personally. The writers of the Bible came from different backgrounds. They came from the example Moses was an educated, a man educated in Egypt. Joshua was a general. Solomon was a king. Amos was a shepherd. Nehemiah was a government official. Daniel was a government official. Peter was a fisherman. Luke was a doctor. Matthew was a tax collector. And we could go on. They were not from a similarity of background. They wrote in different states of mind. Some of them wrote in times of great joy and great national privilege. Other people wrote in states of mourning and despair. It was composed on different continents in Asia and Africa and Europe and in three different languages. It was written in Hebrew. It was written in Aramaic. It was written in Greek. And yet the message of the Bible is a consistent, cohesive unit because it is God's revelation of who he is, at times showing how he interacted with different people groups. And you get to see elements of his being as he has personal relationships with different nations and with different peoples. And you can see how he responds and his instructions of how most of the time it's got a lot of history in there too. You see how he deals with people who are incredibly disobedient and messed up. Don't, don't confuse everything the Bible writes as something that it affirms. In fact, the Bible writes down the good, the bad, and the ugly about p- humans' lives. It tells not just David's triumphs, King David from the Bible, but it shows his lowest of lows, his great sins, his, his blundering mistakes. And that we see that in all the Old Testament pointing forward, towards the person of Christ, showing man's need, showing God's preservation of a faithful remnant, of a people who hold too true to his truth, and who are supposed to be a blessing to others by passing that on and pointing to that person of Jesus Christ by whom he would save the world, the entire world, those who put their trust in him. And from that time on, you have the New Testament, which is the last 27 books, and it's pointing Since that time, it tells us the life of Christ and what he did and who he was and how he established the church, which has been his ministry from that time, to carry on the message of salvation. It's an amazing book. There have been many people who have sought out to disprove it. And because they came at it with an open mind, or somewhat of an open mind, that God has miraculously saved them through their studies of his word. Because it is living and powerful in a way because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And when I say living, it's not that the words themselves move around on the page or you have to, you know, put your Bible in a kennel at night. We all know that. But rather, the ultimate author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, is working in the world and drawing men to a relationship. And that's why sometimes you can feel so convicted by a passage in more than an emotional sense. Because the author is unseen and present with you, drawing your heart. So it's, it's, a, it's a unique, unique book. And let's go on here to the next slide. And we see that um, the Bible was indeed inspired by God. And we can put the first verse up here on, on the screen. And what we'll see is in 2 Timothy, and these are, these are not new verses. We've read them here even several times. But it says that from childhood, this is Paul writing to Timothy, You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we start off and we see there that word, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that word, if you're actually going to look at the Greek word, um, could be kind of translated God breathed. It is breathed out by God. 
and as such is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction on righteousness. What well, the Bible is, and some people have called it an instruction manual because, manual because it teaches us how to be in right relationship with God. It teaches us how to live appropriately. But why is it effective? Because it is God himself who has inspired Scripture. And we'll put up the next verse there. And in Second Peter, we also read, they're saying, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You see, it wasn't like Paul sat down one day and said, I'm going to write a letter with my thoughts on who God should be. And then another day, Peter sat down and said, I, I want to now add my thoughts. And then John, who was the last living of the original disciples, said, oh, now I'm going to put my thoughts in. I'm going to have my final book. But rather, the books of Scripture, the reason there is a cohesion, the reason the Old Testament Scriptures culminated in actual events, the reason that... They, the message is the same is because the actual author is the Holy Spirit who is guiding men. It says, um, I have something here. It says, inspiration is the theological word. It's the big fancy religious church word. Taken actually out of Latin, which used to refer to the process by which God superintended Spiro the human authors of Scripture so that they what they wrote was simultaneously their own words as well as the words of God himself. God breathed out his words the word, using the minds and personalities of his spokespeople. Thus, spirit-inspired writings, God has preserved a historical theological record of his words and deeds and has given it to his covenant people as a means of grace by which we might fully trust him and obey him. And when you think about that, that's, that's just a pretty amazing miracle. If you read 1 John, if you knew Greek, you'd see John doesn't have a very great vocabulary. He had like a fifth grade education when it came to the Greek language. Now that's, that's understandable because his he already spoke a couple different languages. He was probably proficient in conversational Greek because he was a businessman and a, and a fisherman at one time. He obviously spoke Hebrew, and he knew, would have known Aramaic. So he's at least trilingual. So let's not be knocking his educational level. But you can read the level of Greek, and it's not the super complicated sentences and extra high vocabulary. It'd be a nice basic reader. And when he writes, he writes clearly, but simply. Then you get to the book of Hebrews. And if you ever thought Hebrews was difficult to read in English, try reading in the Greek, because that is written like at a Ph.D. level. The person who wrote the book of Hebrews, and also um, Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts, wrote at a very high level. So here is, is God, through the Holy Spirit, using the abilities and personalities of these two different people. Luke, being a doctor, and through guidance of the Holy Spirit, is writing down all this medical information. When there was a medical thing, he would write down how, what the actual thing was going on. Now, this person had this medical condition for this many years. You could tell he was very articulate. Um, and yet, when he writes with some of the other people, he, you can see their personality coming through, and yet it is still Scripture. And I start to go, how do you do this stuff, God? You can take who I am, and it's still your work. I, 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 guess, I guess the best example I could have in my own mind is the other day, uh, one of my sons was wanting to swing a golf club in the backyard, and he's trying to swing. And I said, okay, hold still for a minute. So you go behind him, grabbing his hands, and we're just practicing. Feel how that is. You know, pulling it back and see, see how your hips are in, and kind of guiding him through. He's moving, but there was a parental element to try and guide his swings. Well, much more perfectly how God used the personalities and even limitations in some case to perfectly write who he was. It's a, it's, a, it's a unique book. It's, a, it's an amazing book, inspired by God. Now, we use some, a couple terms here and how I'm going to use them. Sometimes you, you may hear some, I'm going to throw out a lot of big terms. There's some people say, the Bible is verbal, plenary, inspired. You're like, what does that mean? Well, you don't really have to know. What I'm going to tell you, that means every word is inspired, every individual word. In fact, Jesus Christ said, not a jot or tittle will vanish. Every little least stroke of the pen was inspired by God. 
The, the writers did not make mistakes. But also the whole message was inspired. So the individual mes- words were inspired. The big message was inspired. God had the details and he had the general meaning. All inspired by God. Um, we want to say that that is, of course, in the original autographs. Have people made mistakes with their Bible in the transmission of it? Like if I make a copy of a verse, I can tell you for sure because I have written on the whiteboard before for my classes and I have written down incorrectly. Because me writing down John 3.16, the most known of all verses in the Bible, at least in our culture, when I write that down, sometimes I can write it wrong. I can misspell something. I could transmit that from the paper up there or from my memory up there incorrectly. So that doesn't mean that any time anyone writes down a Bible verse, be there an individual pastor or be there a publisher, they have gotten it absolutely right. And in fact, as I've used in this example before, there was the wicked Bible, which just happened to leave out one of the knots in the Ten Commandments, and it made adultery um, encouraged. Not exactly, and you can see why it's called the wicked Bible. They rounded them all up and they burned them all. And the publishers were fined a year's salary. By the way, if you have one of those today, it is the most expensive Bible you can possibly own due to its... uh, but let me just let me just clear you out. If you have one of those six copies, it may be left. That is not inspired. You cannot set aside the commandment because a publisher just said, I'm just striking that word, right? No, as a matter of fact, what we would say is this error is an error in translation or in transmission, but the original autographs, that's what we call them, were fully inspired by God. I'm also going to tell you that we are we serve a gracious God who has preserved his message. And this was, this was made evident. So while there have been instances where a translator may have misprinted a page, when we go back, it's not like the telephone game. game. You remember that telephone game? Where you, just, you start a story, you can start on one end and say, tell a sentence, and you whisper to the next person, they whisper to the next person, you get to the end and it's just not the same. But when they have compared the version of the Bible that we have today, that God in his sovereignty has preserved and protected his book, his works. And what case in point being the scroll of Isaiah, the great Isaiah scroll found in the Holy Land. This is a work that predates Jesus Christ. They pulled it out of the earth and they compared it to Isaiah. And you know what they found? It's the same. There's a minor, minor spelling variance of places and a couple equivalents of a couple punctuation marks that got rearranged. They have this enormous book of the Bible, preserved. And you go, how, is that, how can that be? Well, one, of course, the people who, who have copied the Bibles are very diligent because they knew they were dealing with holy things. But secondly, you can see that God, while he works for frail human beings, wants his message to continue. And we thank him for that. As it's translated in different languages, as it's passed around the world, That God will not let his word fade away. And we thank him for that. Well, because the word of God, because the Bible is the word of God, then that brings us to the next point, which means it has authority. It's not, I was reading a book, and it's not even by somebody who would hold to an evangelical Christian tradition like we do, and but they were talking about the Ten Commandments, and he said, you know, they're not called the Ten Suggestions or the Ten Good Ideas. They were the Ten Commandments. Why? Because they were spoken from God. It couldn't be like, I like one, two, four, and seven, but the others I'm not so sure about. Right? No, as a matter of fact, you had to say, this is God's command. And when he says, God has spoken, we need to recognize that he is the king of kings. And if we want to live correctly, we need to submit ourselves to the Bible. And so many times we try to stand in judgment over the Bible instead of letting it stand in judgment over us. I don't have to make the... I, the Bible doesn't have to adjust to my lifestyle and personality and culture and bent, but rather I have to adjust to it. Some of those passages are hard, and they take some study. You're like, okay, pastor, I, I don't understand. I'm new to this Bible thing. I'm reading Leviticus. There's regulations on mildew. I don't get it. Well, thankfully, you live in a new covenant. You don't need to worry about that. There is a council in Jerusalem. I can take you to a passage in Acts. You can don't worry about the mildew, but let me show you where to start. But it is still an authority. Well, let's go on. Let's go on the next slide here. And some more of the uniqueness of the Bible. We've already talked about that God has preserved his work, and we say the Bible is inerrant. And we were just talking about that being in the original autographs. Um, 
that when it is interpreted correctly, it is inerrant. And you said, when interpreted correctly, I don't mean that in the sense of you can't trust what's in your hands. But there are people who try to read into the Bible what they want to read into the Bible. And for example, this is not an appropriate reading of the Bible. I'm going to just pick out words at random and say this is God's word, right? That's not how you do it. So Judas went out and hanged himself. Well, that, that's not very encouraging. Let's go to another passage. Go and do likewise. <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, one last try. Let's try it again. Whatsoever you do, do quickly. Right? I mean, that is not, that is not a correct interpretation of the Bible. Can we understand that? And you can't say every promise in the book is for me. Okay? And, and this is what I'm saying. You can trust here, but not every promise is for me. Some, some of the promises were for specifically for pe certain people and certain people groups. I don't read that you will give birth to a child and you will call his name Emmanuel. That is not a promise for me. It is a promise that affects me. But I have to read in context, too. And is, there's poetry, there are books of prophecy, there are books of command, and there are, books, and there are portions of history where God records things that we are not called to do. And in fact, like I said before, it records atrocities that people committed on people who should have been people of God and people who weren't people of God, and we are in no way supposed to emulate them. Um, but understand, is God recording this or is he instructing us? And that's what I mean by interpret correctly. We can believe the record, but you're saying, is this a command? Is this a warning? Is it a caution? Is it a prayer? Is it a prophecy? And it's not like some hidden secret thing. You just read it like you would read regular literature and take it accordingly because God has graciously accommodated our, himself to us and written in a manner that we can understand by common linguistic practices. Well, the Bible... Oh, by the way, if you're ever interested in knowing about what we believe about inerrancy, uh, we subscribe to what's called the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. It's six pages long and it's kind of dry, but you can look that up and there's copies of it and just saying, this is what we mean by the words inerrancy. We believe God has wrote his word. It's perfect. Um, he's preserved his word graciously. But it goes down to things where sometimes we say things, even in our English language, that the Bible has said, oh, see, the Bible's not true. Um, they used to say that, well, God made the sun stand still. The Bible's not true. They, people back then, they thought the earth was, sun was going around the earth, so it's not true. Well, it's, they will use language as we would use them because I could pick up a paper today. I know none of you get papers anymore. You probably get it online. But that being the case, I could pick up the paper and see the time for sunrise. Well, somebody 200 years from now could come down and say, well, those, those 21st century Americans, see how stupid they were? They thought the sun actually rose. They thought it sank into the ocean. You could, no, what you're using is common vocabulary to describe a term. We can, we also say, I'll say anyways, maybe you don't, the sun's really high in the sky right now to describe it's the middle of the day. Do I really think that the sun is higher in the sky at that moment or we are just at that certain point of turning on our axis that the sun looks like it's the highest point? That takes way too long. It makes you sound like a colossal geek, right? So we're going to use words that we understand. That's also true with the Bible. So, moving on. The Bible is an amazing book. We, we, oh, no, no, go back. Sorry. Um, it, it's illumination. Illumination. And, and that's just uh, a really neat benefit that God gives believers especially, but sometimes other people as well, that when you pick up God's word, if you're a believer, I can attest that it is normal for you to have a greater understanding of what is written. It, why? Because when you're a believer, God puts his Holy Spirit inside of you. That's the author. That's why sometimes you read a passage 37 times in a row, and all of a sudden you go like, oh, that applies to this. Because the Holy Spirit is prodding us and leading us and showing us what this word means, not just in a historical context, but in application to our own lives. And we read in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him. And so no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things which have been freely given to us by God. So when God puts his spirit and God knows what he wrote, 
He can reveal to us in a way that we may not have had the understanding before. And I have, I've shared this before. I had, I had a good friend. He was actually a not a good friend. I had a good friend who had a friend. The, the this other kid was a pastor's kid. He grew up in church, but he was not a believer. He didn't believe in God. He wanted to do his own thing. And he'd grown up around the Bible. He'd heard Bible stories. He'd probably read it cover to cover, had no interest in it, had no desire to find God. And then shortly before he graduated from high school, he had a conversion and decided to put his trust in Jesus Christ for salvation and become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I got to talk to him. First time I ever met him was two weeks afterwards. And, and my friend Kurt was really excited to see this change in his friend who was, went from being antagonistic to the things of God to embracing them. And, and I asked him, I said, so, is, so what's different? And he said, you know what's really crazy? Is I can't stop reading the Bible. And I used to not understand it, and now it's like every word makes sense. So here's a man who grew up in the church. Why? Because the Holy Spirit does what we call illuminates. And he tells us, helps us to understand it also has animation. You're like, what, what's animation? Um, animation is it has power. And we read in Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That God, it has a power to give change. One of the kids in my youth group, his dad had written down a verse, or not a verse, a quote in the front cover of his Bible, which you may have heard before, and it is a little bit of a cliche, but it said, remember, this book will keep you from sin, but sin will keep you from this book. Because as we take in God's word, it does, it changes the way we think. It helps us to have a right mind, which helps us to have right actions. There is a power to it that, that we don't often practice. But animation, it, it can bring the dead to life, so to speak. Now, the believer in the Bible, let's go on to this next slide here. So then what should we do with what we've been looking at? Now, I could have talked probably for four sermons on what we've already been talking about. And we've done so in the past. And we did a whole theology of Revelation, both the Bible and Jesus Christ, and how God has spoken to people in general. But what we need to see is we are called as believers to have a knowledge of the Bible and to understand what is written. Now, that in order to understand it, we need to have a part in it. You don't just absorb the Bible by osmosis, right? You don't just hold it up to your head, push it in. That would be really nice. You know, do a little USB port, back of the head. Now, now I've got all the Proverbs memorized. Now, personally, while that sounds great, I'm just a little concerned about what other people might put in my brain while I slept. So I'm really glad we have to do this the old-fashioned way. But we do. We have to read God's word in order to take it in. And we see him with this first verse we'll pull up here on the on the screen that uh it says be diligent right that's a good action dedication word to present yourselves approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. And we see there that we are called to be diligent to study to learn By means of example, that's some of you in this room have, have this crazy notion that someday in your life you want to run a marathon. Some of you have, and you know, kudos to you. Good job. I'm, I'm, I don't plan on doing that, um, but it sounds way too painful and too much work. But if you want to run a marathon, you don't just go in and listen a marathon and run it. You don't. You don't say, you know what, I'm tired of being a couch potato. I'm going to run a marathon. What you have to do is you have to build a regiment of working up to that point. You have to exercise. You have to go out. You have to train yourself for that. You start off in slow increments and build to larger increments until your body is ready to run the longer distance. And sometimes we do get frustrated, and, and, and rightfully so, when we're not doing what we should and saying, I'm not where I should be in terms of my study of Scripture, in terms of my knowledge of Scripture, in terms of like last week with my prayer life. But what we want to do is set that goal and then have to become regimented and regimented and disciplined to do that. If I did decide to run a marathon, I'd probably start running shorter distances, but I'd have to do it consistently to build up the stamina to read, and in this case, to read more, to pray more. And it's going to start with a consistency and a dedication on our part. 
And you know what's great? The more I read God's word when I'm doing that, and really when you're in that moment, the greater desire, the greater understanding, the greater capacity I have to take in more. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Next verse we'll put up here as well. It says, your word, and these are from Psalms. We jump around. Psalm 119 is a great praise of God's word in general. And I could have picked out any number of verses from this mammoth chapter. But it says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I will meditate on your precepts and will contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And these words like meditate, and we said this just a couple weeks ago, this is not a meditation like an emptying of your mind, but rather a conscious, intentional focusing on God's word. So it's saying, I will not only read your word, but I'll think about these things. I will, I will set my mind on them. And you can see how the psalmist is saying, I want to know your word that I might live correctly, that my mind might be right. There's another verse, which isn't on your screen in First Peter. It says, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if you have indeed tasted that the Lord is gracious. So we are called to understand the Bible. We need to read it. And if you're a bad reader, you know, get it on CD, get it on MP3, do whatever. Um, start slowly. There's, there's other, we have a great lot, amount of options that we really are without excuse for a reason to take in God's word. Well, there's also, we can see, a call to application. So we'll go to the next slide here and pull up a verse um, that we're not just to take in God's word and some of these verses we just read, but we're supposed to put it into practice. And in James, we read, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. What good is it to be given the instructions if you're not going to follow them? Husbands, when your wife is out of town, you get a list of instructions. When your wife is about to come back into town, you know that you have not followed the instructions. And the couch may be your resting place. It's just true, right? Because we're like, getting the instructions is not enough if we, if we purpose in our heart not to follow them. It's like, that is a great thing. And how many times do we do this, right? We come and you hear the pastor preach, and you, other than going, when is he going to stop? You think, that is, this is a great sermon for my friend Charlie. Right there. Hey, Charlie. This is a sermon for you. And, and Charlie's thinking at the same time, you know, I heard that, but I was thinking that Ryan guy is who really needed to hear this today. And But we know what we need to do is each of us needs to put into practice what we've heard. And you're like, but that's no fun. And, you know, and honestly, let me, let me tell you, a lot of people get bored with the Bible. You know why we get bored with the Bible? Because we're, we're learning it as an intellectual exercise with no intent to put it into practice. That is boring. It is. But if we're going to do this, it's easy to understand. If you believe it, it's hard to do. But we need to do it. Oh, one more verse we're going to pull, or a couple more verses we'll pull up here. Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And again, he said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. There's a story of a, of a man whose son was in college, and he was short on tuition. I mean, he had tuition, but he didn't have money for other incidentals, books, things. And his dad was trying to encourage him in his faith, and I can't rightly remember whether it was a Bible or was a, a devotional, but he mailed him a book and said, read the book, I'll mail you the money. And the son got really mad. Like, Dad, i got enough work to do, I don't want to read the book. And so a week later, Dad, you haven't seen the money. He said, you haven't read the book. Did you get the book? You haven't read the book. He's really ticked off. But bills are trying to get due. And a couple days later, I don't have, if you read the book, I'll mail you the money. Otherwise, it's, it's closed. So he sits down. He starts reading the book. And he starts reading the book. He gets 50 pages in. And between page 50 and 51 is the check. He's been there all along. And I only say that because so many times we come to God and say, God, I want to understand what your will is for my life. God, I want to understand how to change. God, I want to understand what's right from wrong. God, I want to understand how to have a right mind. God, I want to understand. He's like, read the book. It's in there. You are going to get out of this if you're willing to put in. Well, let's close this up. Um, 
I would just encourage you, wherever you are in, in, in your reading with God, try, try and take it a step further. Maybe for you, that's going to be reading a chapter a day. Maybe it's going to be a few verses. Maybe you're already reading consistently and you just need to be encouraged of to be diligent in your reading. But it takes, it takes discipline and we need to build up that endurance. In the same way exercise takes discipline and regularity, if we're going to have any impact from our exercise, the same way as with the reading of God's Word. I had a good friend of mine. He was uh, getting a little older in his life. And he was he was diagnosed with diabetes. Some of you have diabetes. And because he needed to properly respond to that, he started walking every morning. He said, I need, I need to be in good shape. I want to live long. I want to see my grandkids. And he walked. And he does. He still does. He walks consistently. He's a friend of my dad's. And my dad said, I can't believe how disciplined you are about working out now. He said, before I got this diagnosis, he said, working out was a good idea. Now it's a matter of life and death. And the same way, taking God's word, we were said that these are the words of life. If we are going to experience the life that Jesus purchased for us, we also need to be diligent and dedicated. Simon Peter asked Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And God is gracious, and he has preserved these words through his spirit, that we too may prosper because of them. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you would love us enough to show us who you are. And that you would send your son and then preserve your words of life and hope in the Holy Bible. God, may we not treat it as a a common thing. But may we purpose to be dedicated and to learn it and allow it to change us. That we may be your people, not just in name and in in truth, but also in practice. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen.